So what I intend to do um, in, over, over the next few hours is um, going to go over um, some very introductory um, level material um, to, to many of you and probably will be new stuff to some of you. Uh, we have a very diverse group of people here and instead of trying to show you say latest research or so, I'm going to go back to the basics and I'm going to discuss what are statistical estimators, what is maximum likelihood, what is maximum margin, what is score matching, uh, what is CD, and I will do all of this in the context of the restricted Boltzmann model. And then I will use uh, the estimators to actually map us from probabilistic models to completely deterministic models. And so you'll see that it's possible actually to navigate in that space as well, as Mark Corelio has already pointed out. And, um, and, and I'll also continue pointing out some reasons for why sometimes it makes sense to uh, design algorithms with you know, deterministic perspective in mind and why sometimes it's important to uh, embrace probability as you already heard this morning. All right, so let me get this first right. So a, a lot of this workshop uh, of the summer school has been about unsupervised uh, feature learning and uh, there's different ways of doing unsupervised uh, feature learning and um, I was wondering if one of you or a few of you could tell me how can you learn from data in an unsupervised way? What are the strategies? K-means. What does K-means do? K-means is an algorithm, but it's following a principle. Clustering. Clustering. So I'm going to write here clustering. What else? Reconstruction. Reconstruction. I'll put that with this. Not quite the same, but. We've seen a few more. At least this week, I've seen a few more on the board. Jason Weston, word embeddings, how was he learning them? Was it reconstruction? The word embeddings. He learned them, so he was showing to you, he had a network and then he, had, he did Viterbi and so on, and then in the end he showed you some words and they said it just didn't work. So instead, I took a very big data set and I decided to learn in an unsupervised way. Do you guys remember what loss function he was using at that point? Martin, Mark already has been paying attention. Someone actually mentioned rank loss, indeed, that's correct. Okay, what does the rank loss do? What's the sort of fundamental trick there? It orders examples. It orders them according to what? So it's contrasting one thing against the other. In, in, um, in the word example, it was contrasting real sentences against corrupted sentences. Okay. So the principle there is you know what your data is and anything that's a corruption of what data is, is not data. We need to make, create a model that is much more, that maximizes that gap between data and what is not data in the world. Okay, that's a very powerful way to do unsupervised learning as Jason West um, demonstrated. Um, what are other form of contrast of learning have we seen in this workshop? Finding architectures and, and neighborhood component analysis. Neighborhood component analysis is a great one. Siamese nets is another great way to do things. 
contrastive CD. Okay? And there's many other ways of contrasting. I will argue that contrasting is one of the great um, um, You've also heard from Andrew um, about the, uh, our theories about the existence of the, the one algorithm, the one principle that um, describes uh, most of our brain behavior. Um, today I will be talking about principles that might be describing how we actually learn from the world. So going back to the very basics, um, to the general uh, concepts. All right, so reconstruction, contrast of learning, and association, correlation. Time is a great teacher. You see this thing here now, in a few seconds you'll see it there. And then you learn to predict where things move, as uh, we saw yesterday in the videos of uh, uh, Roland and um, Bruno. Um, spatial correlation is also important, and these are very important for the sort of type of biological learning, bi you know, learning about sounds and, and touch and vision and so on. Um, but they also are important about non-biological learning. You go to web pages, you need to learn, you, all the data is unsupervised. You get web pages with positive tags, you never get web pages with, that say, this picture is not Jennifer Aniston. And so, we, so the problems that conf the technological problems that confront search engines are just the same problems, where you have lots of positive examples, but you don't have negative examples. And the trick is always figuring out what are you going to correlate with what. Um, for example, Google has uses, I don't know if Google does this, but I, I suspect they do. Um, people that query for images end up clicking on some images. And now if you search for Jennifer Aniston and you keep, keep clicking on um, pictures of Jennifer Aniston, you're giving Google a signal that that image is, uh, is what goes with that query. And for Google to know what to match to what is where actually is where the, the smart is. It's, and the reason why I suspect this is because even now I was looking for pictures of my collaborators and often some of the top images are sort of very, uh, uh, shall we say, sexy. And that's because I think people get distracted and click on other things <laughs> when searching. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to be talking about some of the meta choices we have to deal with when we're doing, um, you know, feature learning. Um, the, the first is this probabilistic versus deterministic that you've, we've already heard about. And I will try to get some formal mapping between these two ways of approaching problems um, tomorrow. Um, this afternoon, if I get to it, I'm going to start talking about all the many ways people talk uh, used to describe data. Um, who here has had a formal course in maximum likelihood? I like two lectures at least. Okay, so we're go I'm going to cover maximum likelihood, say so why it is that we do it, where, where it comes from. If you've seen it before, uh, maybe go for coffee. Um, I'll talk about max margin, score matching, ratio matching, pseudo likelihood, contrastive divergence, um, and just mention briefly other, way, other techniques that people have come up with to do inference. Uh, econometrics is also full of very interesting models like indirect uh, approaches, like indirect inference and the method of moments and simulated moments and so on. So it's a good place to go and look for ideas. Um, I'll also touch briefly on our computer models, our static nets of images and um, a different approach which is based on dynamical systems, more like the approach of biological uh, creatures. And uh, an even bigger meta choice for maybe some of you if you're starting, or maybe not for you, but certainly for a lot of starting students and is are we going to go and do work with the uh, AI profs or these machine learning profs? Um, the AI profs are doing things like logic, they're doing search, um, constraint satisfaction, and is any of that stuff related or has it got any bearing on what we do. I will argue via a very simple example that it's, um, that these problems, are, uh, these all problems of AI are still very relevant uh, to what we do. Okay. 
Um, another question we and there's many more questions that we face. So regularizer, no regularizer, layers, what kind of pooling, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm not going to go into these details. I'm going to stay with these other questions because I think you've heard a lot about um, the other choices. Um, an important one that arises often, and, and as I said, I'm going to keep this very tutorial, um, is the one of um, what happens as we get more data. So we're going to go back to simple statistics. Um, so here what I'm showing you is um, uh, I had a polynomial of degree 2. So that's the truth. And I used that polynomial to generate data. So I basically took points in that polynomial. That was a quadratic polynomial, so it's a quadratic. And I just sampled um, data from it. In other words, if I have a quadratic function, what I did is I sample a bunch of points from this quadratic function to generate some data. Okay. Now, I fit to it a linear model. And a linear model cannot possibly ever fit the quadratic. It, there's, some, um, there's a fundamental problem. A line cannot ever approximate a quadratic. To the, uh, the line does not have enough capacity. So what happens? Well, first of all, the error is never zero. There's a minimum error because there's a variance here. And if your error is completely zero, you're overfitting. There will always be a minimum error. And for these models, which are all Gaussian, we can actually compute it. So you should never be able to do better than um, your noise. Um, if you go below this line, you're fitting noise as opposed to fitting the signal. Of course, in practice, in real problems, we don't often know where this line lies. Um, what I'm showing you here is I'm doing cross-validation. So I broke the data into two data sets. And I'm showing you the train set performance and the test set performance. They're about the same, so they're level. So if I did a cross-validation test, and I would say, well, my cross-validation and training data set's about the same, so I think I got the right model. Okay, But you'd be wrong, because you still are uh, underfitting. If you happen to have the right model, so your model is of degree true, 2, which is the same as the truth, then you get these beautiful fits. Note that in the training set, you start, by, you start by overfitting. But as the number of data increases, as you increase the training set, um, you basically attain the optimal rate. And your test set goes down. So if you have the right model that matches reality, Everything is beautiful. Here is the Google trick. Make your model very complex. So the model is a polynomial of degree 25. And it's very lousy if you have a very small training data set. But if you have a very large training data set, the model works. Okay? There's no magic. This is just some very basic uh, statistics. So. All right, so let's go back to AI. And the plan in this lecture, I'm going to keep it very sort of simple. We're going to go revisit AI. And we're going to re then look at uh, the re what AI tells us about Hopfield networks and how Hopfield networks connect to what we are studying here. How many uh, people have looked at Hopfield networks before? OK, so. I'm wondering if it's always the same people. <laughs> I've seen Jason doing it twice. OK, so um, I'll start with SAT. And how many people have seen SAT before? OK, a lot more, so I'll go quicker. So I'm in particular, I'm going to look at two SAT. Um, so what is SAT? SAT is basically a way, a way of verifying if some logical sentences are satisfied. So um, I have here an example where I have four logical sentences. Uh, parrots imply uh, all parrots are birds, all birds fly, everything that flies escapes, uh, everything that flies has wings. Okay, so this, that, that's my database. Okay, it's a database of logical sentences. Implication is the same as saying not parrot or bird. And um, again, revision. Um, if, if all parrots are birds, if something is not a parrot, then it may or may not be a bird. So 
true. If something is a parrot, um, and you've said that all parrots are birds, you cannot have this thing happening in the world, so you got a false statement. And parrots are birds, you got a one. Okay, so basically not P or B is the same as this implies that, and that's my database. Okay. Um, each of these things is called a clause. And in order to know whether you have an instance in your database that satisfies all of this, uh, we take an and of this. Okay? And that's essentially the satisfiability problem. And it actually has huge implications in engineering, and especially of semiconductors. Um, we, we owe a lot to this formalism. Uh, SAT is also important for a different reason, um, that um, a lot of intractable problems in computer science uh, basically the you know NP hard problems can be uh, you can do a simple reduction to SAT and SAT has been shown to be NP hard so if you can do three SAT if you, if you do a reduction to this problem then you can say how hard or easy the problem is um, I'm going to use this following picture to illustrate the same sentences so basically P is for parrot um, red means not and a blue means yes, and then this is just an end of the four sentences, okay? Now, let's do some exercises with this first. And, and soon you'll see why I, it is that I'm spending time with um, uh, SAT. So I handed, um, so the first thing I'm gonna do here is ask you the following uh, verification question. Um, if I assign, so the, let's say that these variables are all truth or false, one means true. Um, if I assign the assignment p equal one, b equal one, et cetera, et cetera, does this satisfy SAT? Yes. Okay, and just let's do one quickly. So if you put ones there, you'll get a zero here, you get a one here, zero, one, 0, 1, 0, 1. So if you take an OR of 0, 1, you get a 1. And an AND of all 1s gives you a 1. So the answer is yes, because you, you have a 1. OK, the next one, does it satisfy SAT? OK, so I'm going to give you guys two minutes to write it down. I kind of require you to do this because I've handed out little pieces of paper and unless you can do this, the, the, the rest of the game will not work. Well, let me do one more. Instead of giving you two minutes, I'm gonna do this one and then I'm gonna let you do it by yourself. Okay, so what would I do here? Well, I have now the assignment in green one, zero, one, one, one. So this is still one, zero. This would still be a one. This will be a zero. A one is still a one. Uh, zero gets negated, so I would get a one here. And so here I would get a zero and a zero, right? So this should be a zero, one, one, one. So this should be a zero. So I think the answer is no. Okay. What is the maximum number of clauses that can be satisfied in this case? All of them. So we've already shown that it's possible to satisfy all of them. It's four. In some problems, answering that question is not easy. Because you might have some problems where um, not all of them are satisfied. We're gonna, not going to make you do that, but I'm going to ask you to do another uh, solve another problem, which is what is the maximum number of possible assignments that will result in S being true? Okay. So first I'm going to ask you, how could we find out? Enumerate all of them. Now, I'm a lazy guy, so I'm not going to enumerate all of them. So I've handed out to you, to some of you during the break, pieces of paper with five binary numbers. 
Okay? So those are numbers of the form 10011, something like that. So all of you who have a binary number like that, so we're going to do distributed computation. If you have the, the bar, the negative just means that that's the left side, order matters. Um, and so what I'd like you to do is if you have one of these numbers, team up with the person next to you and check whether it's satisfiable or not. And we will get the answer that way. Oh, and in this one, I really require that you do it because I do not know the answer. And if anyone lost the paper, then we will be in trouble. <laughs> Which is a problem with distributed computation when you don't have fault tolerance. Yes. All right, so there should be two to the five people um, doing this exercise, plus their colleagues. Who's got the answer? Who, who, like for their own thing? So actually, hands up for whoever's done it already. There have to be 32 hands, otherwise we're in trouble. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. We are in trouble. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to start on this side of the class. Um, who has done it? Who's got the answer? Who's, who has a piece of paper? OK, and so basically, um, how are we going to do this? Whoever has a piece of paper, put your hand up and give me a number, where it's, whether it's a 0 or a 1. 1 means satisfiable, 0 means not satisfiable. Let's start from there. I have a 1. Uh, hang on. Zero. zero there. I think I got you already. And that, another zero there. Zero. There's two guys over there. Zero. And how many do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 14, 15, I'm missing one. Oh, you also have one, zero, 16. So the number of satisfiable closes is an estimate <laughs> at best <laughs> that is four. Oh, we have another one? Oh, we're in trouble. <laughs> exact enumeration is very tricky business to do in distributed computation because of fault tolerance. Okay. And the other thing we learned in the, doing this is that it's painful. It, it's painful to solve a problem called counting SAT, which is the equivalent of computing the partition function of an Ising model, as we'll soon see. Um, so, um, oh, actually that first question was just two to the five, 32. And this is an estimate that it's four. I'm going to play another game. And this one is fault tolerant. And uh, we just learned this method from Ian this morning. So I want you all to take a coin to, from your pocket. And we're going to do some randomization. If you don't have a coin, I can give you a coin. So here's the exercise. You will flip the coin five times each. And then if it's heads, it's a one. If it's tails, it's a zero. All right. Now comes one bit that is hard, which is the number of satisfied students, meaning that you we're satisfied with, not the exercise, but with, you got a one, 
as s was equal to 1, and the total number of students. All right, how many people here did this exercise? Well, students and profs and so on, etc. Plus, plus. Um, how many people did the exercise? I'm going to have to estimate that it's, how many people are here? <laughs> it's about 100 people. Uh, we're going to do this rough. How many people got a one? About 13? It's about 0 0.1. It's about 10%. Um, now, oops, sorry about that. Let's use our hammer. And we multiply to get the expected number of clauses that we have that are satisfiable. We just multiply the probability of s equal to 1. by 2 to the 5, which is 32, and we get 3.2 as our estimate. Okay. The beautiful thing about this was that I did not have to write down numbers and cut them with scissors and distribute them, and that this was totally distributed. This was fault tolerant. And if I ask you where was the intelligence in the room, you'll realize that it was nowhere. It was distributed. So you arrive at very interesting answers. You arrive at the computations of partition functions and so on in a completely distributed form. So how does SAT relate to deep learning? Um, I'm going to make a small change of variables here. These p, b's, parrots, and birds, and so on. I'm just going to call them x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. And I'm going to assume that some clauses are harder to satisfy than others. So I'm going to add a weight to this. OK, those weights will be theta 1, theta 2, and so on. And I'm going to do the following trick. If a variable is negated, and this is just a very simple reduction. If a variable is negated, I'm just going to write it as a binary <coughs> variable, p. And now it, this will be a random variable, p. That's either 0, 1. And if the variable is not negated, I'm just going to write 1 minus b. So that's my transcription rule. And I use that to transcribe each. And then I add them to give me this guy here. And I'm going to call that the energy. That's just an arbitrary name. We'll see soon why that matters. Um, of course, what you see that we have now here is an Ising model, where my variables are given by this and where my edge potentials are given by these parameters. How they give me constraints, satisfiability constraints. So a graphical model is indeed um, encoding, an undirected graphical model is encoding compatibilities or constraints. Um, if I replace indeed these p, b's, and so on by x1s and x3s and x4s, I get this model which is the energy for an Ising model for a Boltzmann machine or restricted Boltzmann machine that we've seen. And then it's a simple exercise to see that what these Ws are, um, which ones are theta 1, theta 2, and so on. And this is essentially our graphical model. So it's very easy to reduce a problem called max to sat, which is incredibly hard to solve to a problem that's very easy to, that, that's also very hard to solve, which is minimizing the energy of a Boltzmann machine, subject to the variables being 0 or 1. And some SAT problems are easy, um, um, like just two SAT. And so when we transform that to MRFs, it's also easy. That gives us algorithms like graph cuts and so on. And other problems are very hard, like three SAT. Now, we have an energy. And let's assume that each of the thetas is just set to 1 for simplicity. I can also then, for that energy, with that particular setting of the parameters, so it's basically a homogeneous um, Ising model, because the parameters are the same for all uh, potentials. I can look at, for all these different assignments, what the energy is. 
And if I want to create a model that basically says that things with um, lower energy are more probable, I can just introdu um, introduce a probability distribution like this. So I define a probability distribution over the five random variables. And to ensure that it's normalized, I need to sum over all its possible values. And summing over all these possible values was the exercise we did just now, which is um, NP hard which is enumerating the two to the five possibilities. Okay. Um, so that's nice because anything that gets developed for SAT, and there's many interesting algorithms that get developed out there in the SAT competitions, they're potentially algorithms that we could use to do inference and Boltzmann machines. Not learning, for now we're assuming the weights are known. Now, these Ising models are also used a lot in physics. Um, typically, a 1 indicates that a molecule is present in a volume. A 0 indicates that a molecule is not present. And they're used to study magnetism and so on. The Wikipedia page is an excellent resource. Um, how does this relate to the second law of thermodynamics? The law basically says this. If you have two chambers with, um, let's say, very fast particles and slow particles, and you open the door, the temperature equilibrates. But now, think of like the reds and the blues as being ones or zero. And you have one configuration here. You put two Boltzmann machines together, and you quickly find a ground state energy. Nature is very quick at doing that, okay. which, which is cool. Nature solves problems extremely efficiently, very quickly. Let's look at one more detail about this problem that's interesting, uh, I think for all scientists in this field, which is let's assume we have this little demon. And I did this for an undergrad class at UVC. And someone, and I put this as a question. No, I had some other question in the exam. And this person, like, I, I really don't know the answer, but I love the demon. And she drew this beautiful demon. And <laughs> It's one thing that stays in people's heads. Um, this is Maxwell's demon, and this was a big topic in philosophy. Um, again, I recommend a Wikipedia page on this, where I actually took this from. Um, Maxwell's demon is a demon that controls this door. And let's assume that this door is really nicely oiled, as in it requires no energy to open it or close it. To, it's a very nice door. What the demon does is every time it sees a red particle approaching from the left, it closes the door. Sorry, it opens the door to let the red guy in, and then it lets the blue guys out, but it doesn't let blue guys come in. Okay. So after a while, the demon has broken the second law of thermodynamics. Okay. Assuming that you had this door that involved no energy. Okay. Has the demon broken the second law of thermodynamics? No. I heard a no. Why? It's extremely unlikely. <laughs> yeah. Um, half of the population uh, out there believe in demons, so <laughs> I would say it's at least 50% likely based on beliefs. Sorry. <laughs> Good point. The demon has information. So it seems that information and energy are related. Okay? And when you study thermodynamics, you actually learn these relations between what is computation, what's energy, what's information. We use these terms literally um, all the time without actually giving much thought to what they actually mean. And I think it's important to go, again, back to the principles, to where they come from. I also mentioned this thing before. If nature seems to be doing these problems very efficiently, so um, something that arises um, every now and then is um, someone tries to publish a paper where they try to harness the power of nature to do computing. Um, the way birds flock, the way the water flows, um, the way quantum processes happen in nature to do computation more efficiently. 
Now, the question is, do you guys think we will be able to solve NP-hard problems by harnessing uh, nature? How many people think so? Three believers. <laughs> How many people think not? <laughs> okay. Why not? Because P might not be equal to NP. What other reasons? Are there fundamental limits in nature? Yeah, it's not so much about belief now <laughs> anymore. Okay, what's, what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with warp drive? Why can't I disappear and instantaneously uh, appear, appear back in my office in Vancouver and skip all the United um, drama that I had to endure on the way here? Speed of light. Nature has limits. It's not yet clear that even if we harness quantum computers, we would be able to solve NP-hard problems. Um, it's, you know, now and then you see people claiming that the speed of light can be broken and we still don't know that it can. Certainly there's no evidence. Um, so with fundamental limits in nature, there come fundamental limits in computation as well. You know, because P of E equal MC squared, and then we've already related E to information and so on. Um, so we have to be careful of uh, thinking that we can just look at nature and do computing efficiently. Also, nature, uh, a machine based on nature requires input-output operations, and those can be expensive. I mean, the way birds flock might be a really interesting dynamical system that I could use to do computation. Sorry. Nature? <laughs> Good, excellent question. I'll give me, I'll, I'll come to, to it in two slides actually. I do have a slide for nature. Yeah, I'll come back to nature. <laughs> Let's move in this slide. It is still important to follow nature. As we've learned in all the beautiful talks we've had here, um, Thomas gave like a very inspirational talk on this um, just yesterday, uh, yeah, yesterday morning. Um, if we were to just deal with NP-hard problems, like let's do vision with the space of 256 to the power million images, we would be in trouble. I mean, we, we argued that there's a million optic fibers going through um, LGN. Um, but we do not deal with such a huge space of images. We don't have enough neurons, not even the 100,000 um, to 14 by 14 mapping that Bruno told us about would be enough. These are not the typical, Im I hope these are not the typical images in your life, that this is not nature for you. And I hope nature, um, to answer the question at the back, I hope nature looks like this. And animals love looking at nature. That's my dog Picasso, he loves hanging out and go camping and so on. Going back to nature, here's another fun exercise for you guys now. These are sketches of spiders. <laughs> um, some look more like spiders than others. And so I'm gonna take, a, I'm gonna let you guys vote for one of these guys as to which one you think looks more like a, a jumping spider. That's, that's a jumping spider. So little spiders will walk around and jump. You can see them all, all over the place, including um, around here. If you see one, bring it to class um, after lunch. Um, so jumping spiders, I don't think they're poisonous. <laughs> <laughs> we will find out. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna ask you to tell me which of these eight guys you think is, uh, looks more like a jumping spider, 
and you can only vote for one. So you, it's, it's a soft max, one out of eight. And, and I'm gonna start, basically, which is your preferred most jumping spider-alike character? The first guy, how many people? Zero votes. The last guy, how many votes? Quite a majority. What about this guy? About four people. This guy? Okay, we've got seven people, maybe this guy here with the circle. About two people. I'm trying to make this unbiased. The guy with the two dots. That looks like a spotted spider. This one? We still have two. Okay, if, if you haven't voted, you have to vote for this guy now. <laughs> okay. Now, what I'm showing you here now are the numbers of um, what a mating spider uh, tried to mate with. Okay, a male spider, when presented with one of these images, um, decided to mate with a spider. So just like you, spiders would rather mate with a spider <laughs> than this guy over here. Okay. I took this image from um, one of a talk by Bruno Schausen that I found last night when I was browsing the web um, after he told me all about jumping spiders. They're very interesting because, look, this is generic optic recognition. They see a sketch and they know that that's a spider. That's pretty cool. This is a tiny little spider. This guy in nature. It sees, this is the guy mating. If you, uh, I'll, yeah, go to YouTube, look for the mating videos of the spider. It's really interesting. It's a very complex animal. It also recognizes prey. So it identifies those numbers as prey. And I tried to find the original article 1952 where this comes from. It's in German, so if you speak German, please Google Dries 1952 and tell me what the paper says. Um, here's another interesting thing you find googling. Um, there are these other animals that look, they have evolved, so the, the jumping spider is an excellent hunter, it has these beautiful eyes that can spot where, you know, long eyes in front can spot where the creature is, it has an array of other eyes, um, I don't know how many, it has eight legs because it's an arachnid. Um, and then it's, these eyes even have three layers of neurons and there's high resolution, medium resolution, lower resolution, so that should sound like something familiar. Um, but it, it identifies different wavelengths as you go down these layers, so we can actually perceive it uh, in depth. Um, at least that's what I found in the YouTube videos that I watched last night, so we don't, don't take this as, um, knowledge, as real knowledge of this. But talk to Bruno when he comes to more if you want to learn more about it. What's amazing is that this other guy has evolved to look like a jumping spider so that the jumping spider doesn't attack it. Now that's the beautiful thing of nature. Okay? We haven't just evolved to deal with random stuff, we've evolved to deal with the things that we have to encounter in the world. For this guy, nature is this other guy here that's trying to eat it. And nature is also not only about learning. Nature is about teaching. It's really a game setting. This is a game equilibrium, an evolutionary game theoretic equilibrium, where this guy learns to be like this, not to be eaten. Maybe this guy gets to survive because it eats other things that don't look like other, other flies and moths that don't look like that one. So nature definitely plays a huge role in the way we look, the way we think, and so on. Now, even if we can't solve NP hard problems, we can solve some uh, other hard problems, like the problems of cryptography um, and problems to do with neural computation, which is what concerns us. Um, there are companies, and there are several of these, that are trying to build quantum computers. And what we mean by a quantum computer could be something very different. There's different kinds of quantum computers that try to exploit different quantum phenomena. Um, one of these companies um, tries to build a quantum adiabatic computer. What is a quantum adiabatic computer? Something that is basically doing annealing. So when you do annealing, um, as we heard uh, just now, um, 
you sort of lowering a temperature. Typically, you have an energy term, you have an entropy term. The trade-off between energy, which is exploit, and entropy, which is uncertainty, is the temperature. You anneal it, um, and you find an optimal temperature, which in stats works out to be the Boltzmann distribution that we saw before. Um, but in, in the quantum world, it's even better, because instead of just you know, dealing with distributions, you're dealing with matrices, so because things can be superimposed into states, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and so you can do much faster computation. And this is the this is what the computer does. Um, the computer is actually nothing but an icing model that looks like this, and it's able at least for one of these single guys, which looks like a mini RBM four by four. It's able to sh uh, people, these guys have been able to show that this indeed is performing quantum computation, so it's not noise. Um, they've extended this without going into the proof. Um, they've extended, nonetheless, the chip technologically to uh, be, I think, 128, and I believe they have a 512 uh, bit um, uh, Ising model. Uh, what's nice about this is that you can draw samples from this network very efficiently. And you can find a ground, minimize it, and so on. Um, so it's tempting then to use this model here, which is not quite like the models that we have, um, to do uh, fast inference in, in, in the type of models that we deal with. Um, Misha, who's somewhere over there, I think he tried it, their quantum computer on a 4x4. Um, little, little tiny RBM. And another idea that he's explored is using this connectivity as the connectivity of the hidden layer to be able to deal with larger nets. Of course, this is far, far from the size of the networks that we deal uh, with in practice. And nonetheless, um, quantum computing, nature, and so on comes a lot when people discuss processes that might be going in the brain. And if the processes are quantum, it's still not going to fundamentally change everything we know. We, we might have faster inference, that's it. OK, so um, yeah, let me just finish this quickly, because we had some breaks. Um, when we come, actually, when we come back, um, I'm going to look at a very basic model of a neuron, where you, you take the inputs, you weight the inputs with this uh, transition matrix, Tij, and then if, if this input is greater than um, a particular threshold, the neuron fires. If it's below a threshold, the neuron doesn't fire. So this is sort of the caricature, McCall of Pitts, where instead of a sigmoid, I actually have a hard um, threshold. Um, so that's the neuron. Um, this is the energy for, um, I'm going to go back to the energy that we had before, the Boltzmann energy. And we're going to do an exercise. Um, and the exercise is, and that's Hopfield, um, if this is the energy, we can very easily compute as derivative. The exercise for you to do during lunch and to talk about is, what can we say about the E? Is it positive? And what are the implications of what the E is on the behavior? If you had many neurons just taking messages, firing asynchronously, what would, be hap what would happen to that system? OK, so we go back to the distributed computation. Each of these guys is doing their own little thing. What is the emergent behavior out of that? All right, I'll see you after lunch. Okay.